All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. There's so much to preach in this chapter, but um, we'll be focusing in on more of the latter part of, the, of this portion. But just for, just for in, by way of introduction, you know, Word of Truth Baptist Church, give you a little bit of information about who we are. We're an independent, fundamental Baptist church, in case you stumbled into the wrong place this evening. I don't think anyone has. We're very old-fashioned, and I'm not even just talking about old-fashioned meaning the way people did things in the 70s, or in the 60s, or in the 50s, right? Or even going back to the 40s, right? Now, that's old-fashioned. That would be a step up if, if churches in general were at least going back that far. But we don't go back that far. We go back way farther than that. When we say old-fashioned, we're looking for the old paths that are established in God's Word. I mean, we're going all the way back to the foundation of Scripture. This is old-fashioned. This is where we go and pattern our church after is based on this Word. While there has been you know, time periods in the United States where people were most closely aligned with this word. We're not looking to any era in this country as our guideline. We're looking to the source. This is what we go back to as being old fashioned. Now, being old fashioned in a modern society doesn't go over well with a lot of people. So in turn, this church is not for everybody. You know, a lot of churches want to say, oh, everybody's welcome. We want to make this church to suit you. No, we're not, gonna, we're not making this church to suit anybody except for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we are. As an independent, fundamental Baptist church, we are here solely to please our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to do things the way that the Bible outlines we're going to do them. This is why we're starting out in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, because one of the first things, or what the, the message tonight, what I'm preaching about, is how to behave yourself in the house of God, which has a lot to do with how the church operates and how it's run. And my first point is that church is not a circus. And we see, what well, we see in 1 Corinthians 14, how things can easily get out of control. We see churches today where it's almost like you're walking in to a three-ring circus, where you've got people just in the congregation, jumping up and yelling out and just saying all kinds of weird things. You know, the, the holy rollers, these Pentecostal churches where people just stand up and they start screaming in, in whatever, you know, made up languages. They call it speaking in tongues. I mean, we were even talking to a guy today about speaking in tongues. Like, well, you ever speak, spoke in tongues? No. But they, 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 they use this as like a, a sign of holiness and how, you know, and, and how godly you are. But anyways, I'm going to get into that in just a little bit because 1 Corinthians 14 covers a lot of that and what's biblical and true about that. But the first thing, and, and what I want you to take home, first of all, is that church is not a circus. Okay, church is not here for your entertainment. Church is, is to be run decently and in order. We have an order of service here, and, there's, and, it's, and the reason why we have an order of service is because it's biblical. We have the way things are operated. There's a pastor that's in charge of, of running this church because it's ordained by God, because that's what the Bible says that the church ought to operate. Let's look down here in verse number 27 where we're going to pick up. Now, when the Bible's talking about tongue speaking, just to be clear, we're not gonna, I'm not going to prove this to you, but if you have any doubts about this, you could go back to Acts chapter 2 at the day of Pentecost, and you can see where the people were all speaking tongues or languages that other people actually knew that existed at that time whether they're speaking Arabic, whether they're speaking, you know, any other language of, of the time that from people from other nations spoke, that's what they were speaking. It's laid out very clearly in the Bible. And when we look at 1 Corinthians 14, that hasn't changed. God gave people gifts of being able to speak in other languages that they didn't know. That was a spiritual gift. That was amazing. That's miraculous. But it wasn't what people want to, the hocus pocus people want to want to call it today of just random noises coming out of your mouth and claiming it's some heavenly language that nobody knows. 1 Corinthians 14 covers this. If you ever run into someone like that, just turn to 1 Corinthians 14. Because I guarantee you, even if you want to give someone the benefit, they'll just say, you know what? Okay, yeah, they're speaking some other language. I guarantee you their church is not operating the way 1 Corinthians 14 lays out that it ought to be being run. Look at verse number 27. The Bible says, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, and unknown just means unknown to the people that are present. It doesn't mean that nobody in the world knows that language because it's a heavenly language. It just says it's unknown. People don't know what it is. If you started speaking Chinese to me right now, 
That would be completely unknown to me, and I, pro I might not even know that it's Chinese. I mean, it could be some other Asian language. I don't know. I would have no way of knowing that because I don't know anything about it. It's an unknown language. It's probably unknown to everybody in this room. I don't know that for sure. I know Brother Joseph's got a lot of languages under his belt as far as knowing somewhat about it. But um, if it's an unknown, so verse 27, if man speak an unknown language, or unknown tongue, excuse me, let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course and let one interpret. So in order for a church to be running properly, if someone's going to speak in a foreign language, there has to be an interpreter. Otherwise, there's no, there's no purpose for a person getting up and speaking when nobody can understand that person. He's saying it's going to be done in order. You let two or maybe by three and that by course in order. One person's going to interpret while they're preaching their message. Verse number eight. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. And that person can speak just fine. God's going to understand them. But there's no pe reason to speak in church when no one else can understand you. No one's going to receive edification for that. Look at verse number 29. Let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. Now, we had a good example of this just this morning. Brother Garrett preached a message for us this morning out of God's word. While he was preaching, there's a couple things that came into my mind. You know what I didn't do? I didn't just stop him right in the middle and just start preaching my own sermon while he's preaching at the same time and just say, oh, no, I got this thing to say. You gotta... Everything was done decently and in order. I waited for him to finish and get his points out and, 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 to, and to deliver the message that, that God had laid on him his heart to preach unto our church here this morning. And when he was done, then I came up and I was able to say a few things that God laid on my heart to be able to, to just expound on a few things that, that he had said. This is the, the way that churches ought to operate. It's not a free-for-all. It's not a circus. It's done decently and in order. Look at verse number 31. For ye may all prophesy one by one. There's no reason. You know, it's not restricted to just a pastor being able to preach, by the way, in a church setting. Other people can preach. There's, there's, there's other people that can come up and, and, and preach sermons and give messages. Other men. We're going to get to that in a minute. But if it's going to happen, if it's going to be done, you need to be prophesying one by one. Everyone takes a turn, right? I feel like we're going back to kindergarten. Everyone take a turn, right? You can't all play with the same toy at the same time. Everyone, we're all going to take turns with this. Prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Verse number 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. God wants everything done in order because he doesn't want anyone being confused. When you come into church, it's a place to learn. It's a place to understand. It's a good place to get, to get edification and be exhorted. If everybody's just jumping up and speaking and just saying whatever, and this is why, you know, when, when a pastor's up here or a preacher's up here preaching a message, we're not going to have this dialogue and these conversations and people just, just asking all these questions. It's not a Q&A session. Everything's going to be done decently and in order. If you've got something to say, you know, or if you, if you really just aren't understanding things, well, let the preacher get his point across for everyone else that is understanding, and you talk to him later after service or whatever. Let, let the, the, the preaching be done decently and in order and without just tons of interruptions. Look at verse 34. And this is one of those areas where being an old-fashioned church, has, you know, the, the, modern, the modern society has a problem with that. Because the Bible says, which is our authority, by the way, the Bible says, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now, this is not talking about their culture. This is not saying they had some law in those days, and that's why they need to keep silence, just some, some external law by some Pharisee or by some governor or whatever. This is Scripture in God's word, saying, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. Now, first of all, there's a good reason for this, but even if you don't understand the reason, it doesn't matter if we're looking at God's word and trying to understand you know, and trying to just model our church after what, the, what God's word says. You don't have to understand all the meanings behind it. You have to obey it. And that is what we do here. That is why we will never have a woman come up and preach a sermon. We'll never have a woman come up and present, even present their, you know, their missionary thing or the things that they're doing, right? Anything that, that's, you know, we're going to stay as right on this as we possibly can. 
The Bible even says in the next verse, look at verse 35, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So even when women don't understand something, you know, it's one thing if a guy says, but what about this? Or so, you know, in the middle of the sermon, he says, women, it's not permitted. Now, I don't think we should just be having a Q&A, as I mentioned earlier in the church. But this is obviously talking about someone who doesn't understand something. He's saying, look, even if you don't get it, if something's going over your head, if you don't understand, don't slip up your hand and ask a question. Why? Because it's not permitted for women to speak in the church. This is the way that we operate our church here. Is it because we hate women? No, it's because we love God's word. That's as simple as that. We love women. We don't degrade women here. Right? Hopefully the women here will testify that. We're not, we're not putting women down. But what we are going to do is we're going to follow the way that God says the church ought to be run. And if God says that women are permitted to speak, guess what? We're going to listen to that. We're going to stick to that. And I don't care if people want to call me misogynist. I don't care if people want to say, you know, we're, we should go back to the Stone Ages, whatever. Doesn't matter to me. You call me whatever names you want to call me. I'm going to follow God's word and I'm going to try to follow it to a T the best way that I can. Look at verse number 36. What? And you know, and by the way, before we even get off of that, it says if they will learn anything. So this is obviously talking about, because people want to nitpick and say, oh, so then should women not be singing songs then in the service? This is talking about when the learning is going on, if they will learn anything at home. The singing, everybody's singing praises unto God. That's biblical, that's scriptural, that could be found, I could prove that to you from the Bible, that the whole congregation is singing unto the Lord. That is scriptural. But when it comes to time to learn, when it comes to the time of someone getting up to preach, because that's in the context what we were just talking about. When you've got two or three people, let, let them preach one by one and let the others remain silent. And he follows that up immediately. But let your women keep silence in the church because it's not permitted for them to, uh, to speak. It's a shame for a woman to speak in the church. So that being said, this also goes for the amens. Now saying amen in church or that's right or, or you know, you got it, whatever, you know, when men, when men are given their, their approval, they're saying, yes, amen, that's right. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that in church. I think that's great. I think it's encouraging. It's something that you're public saying, you know what, I agree with that. That's a good message. That's the truth. And other people, you know, that could, honestly, that is something I, I think that is good to have in church for men to be confirming what the preacher's saying because you know what happens when you have, because we don't want people to come in here and hear a, a hard sermon or strong doctrine and then think that, wow, this guy's nuts. I feel sorry for all the rest of these people here, right? Like, like are these people just getting, well, you wouldn't have people confirming and saying, amen, that's right. When a pastor preaches something about, you know, the, that sodomites ought to be put to death because that's what God's laws say, say amen to that. And let other people know. So when you got any people coming in, look, most of the people here, you're all used to this type of stuff and, and you get it. But it's good to have that in you, men, to be an encouragement to say, yes, that's right. I, and obviously only if you agree with it. <laughs> but you, you say the amens when you agree with what's being said, especially when it's something that other people might be thinking, oh, man, that sounds kind of radical. Is that really true? Amen. It is true. That's the purpose of that, is, is to, to give that encouragement, let other people know, yeah, this is, you know, especially other, God, other people that people know, hey, this guy really reads his Bible a lot, and he's saying amen to what the pastor's preaching, and, you know, it's, that's giving another witness to what's being said. But the Bible says it's not that let your women keep silence in the churches. It's not permitted for them to speak, so we don't need to hear the women doing the, the amens and the encouragement, and that's right, and everything else, because... It's not permitted for them to speak. And we're going we're gonna to take that verse extremely literally because just like we take all verses of the Bible that are literal, we take them literally. But let's move on to the next point here. Verse number 36. What came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? And look at this. This, this confirms because people want to try to disobey this commandment on, on, on women speaking in the church. And they try to make up excuses for it. But he says, he confirms in verse 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, right? Because a lot of people that say, oh, I'm, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Well, if you consider yourself to be real spiritual or a prophet, 
Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. This isn't Paul being misogynistic. This isn't the culture at the time that, that just didn't want to allow women to do anything. This is the commandments of the Lord confirmed by the Apostle Paul. And he's saying, you know what? You think you're spiritual? Why don't you just tell me right now you're acknowledging that this is the commandment of the Lord. You're acknowledging that, yes, it is not permitted for women to speak in the church. Then come back at me and tell me that you're, you're spiritual or you're a prophet. Verse 38, But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. And that last verse there kind of su summarizes the way that things ought to be done in this church and the way people ought to behave themselves in this church. No matter what you're thinking about doing or anything that, that you could think of, what, you know, would this be a good idea to do the church? Is it decently? You know, is it decent? You want to bring something in the church, just ask yourself, is this decent? How do you, how do you, how do you, you know, how should I dress to go to church? Is it decent? Everything should be done decently and in order. If I bring this in the church, is it going to make a big, you know, is it going to look like a circus in there? Well, then we probably shouldn't be doing it. Right. Just a couple other scriptures because this is kind of a hot button issue on, on women preaching or, you know, teaching, preaching in the church. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to read for you from uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 2. This is a point I really want to, I really want to drive home and just see all the scriptural evidence for this because it, it is something, it's one of those things that gets people angry. It could get people upset at hearing this type of thing, but you got to ask yourself, what are you getting upset at? Are, are you, you know, the Bible says what it says. The Bible is the word of God. So if you're going to get angry, you get angry at God, but make sure that you're seeing that this actually is in scripture. This is coming from the word of God. And this is not just some man's opinion that you think might think less of women, which, which I don't, but um, and anyone that knows me knows that's not true. But 1 Timothy 2, 11, I'm going to read for you. You're turning to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Timothy 2, 11 says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Exactly what we saw in 1 Corinthians 14. I mean, just, just almost word for word. It's the same exact concept. Let them learn in silence with all subjection. 1 Corinthians 14, 34, let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not per permitted them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience. Being in subjection, being under obedience, same thing. And then in verse 12, it says, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So there we have another testimony of this, of the same exact concept. You're in 1 Peter chapter 3, which is going to tell us how women ought to be and ought to behave. Verse number three, 1 Peter 3, 3, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And this is something that the world today is going to tell you women should not be like this at all. And it's completely antichrist to, to say, you know, oh man, you know, because the world's teaching women today to be loud, to be obnoxious, to not listen to their husbands, to, to, to just do everything on your, oh, you're just as good as a man, which we're not saying you're not as good as the man. But what they mean by that is you can do everything that the man can do. And that there should be no, you know, and now the, the big thing they're talking about, what the, the wage gap, right? Oh, women are making as much as men and, you know, and all these various things. And this is the topic of conversation. And see, this is, again, goes back to the point of, uh, I preached this a couple weeks ago. They got you off on the wrong subject. Right. It shouldn't be talking about how much should women be, be getting paid for the same job that a man does. What is a woman doing in the workplace in the first place? Right. Why are they doing men's jobs? Let the men go out there and earn the income. Let the wife stay at home and raise the family and raise the children and, and be a keeper at home. And let them have a meek and quiet spirit because in God's eyes, the meek and quiet spirit, that's of great value. God looks down at you as a woman. You know, the women that, that feel compelled to want to boss their husbands around, they want to go and boss other people around on the job, they want to go and, and, and just be loud and obnoxious and make sure everybody's hearing what they say. Just remember this, God likes and he has a high value when you have a meek, humble, quiet spirit. This is God's value, great price on women that have that type of spirit, which is, goes hand in hand with them not getting up, not teaching, not preaching from the pulpit, not preaching in church. 
For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. And now we get the example of Sarah, verse number six. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Now, people today would probably flip. Imagine, imagine my family going out to, to Costco, going, going to the grocery store, right? And me saying something to my wife, or we're having a conversation, and she said, yes, my Lord, or yes, sir, or something like respectful, right? Where she is putting herself in subjection to me verbally in front of everybody. People would probably flip out if they heard that today because of our society, because of our wicked, godless, backward society. That's why. Because the Bible elevates the status of Sarah for having do, done just that, for calling Abraham Lord, because she looked at him with reverence and respect. And when she called him Lord in the Bible, she did that in her heart. That wasn't even out loud in front of anybody. That was in her heart. She wasn't, even, she wasn't putting on a show. She wasn't even trying to just do it, right, to be in, to be in God's will, of just like, well, I need to say this because I'm, this is what's expected of me. It was in her heart. That's the way she honestly viewed her husband, which is a godly marriage, a godly um, um, role for her to be in as a wife. And that is why she is elevated and saying, this is what the godly women do. This is, this is the way that God views this. And um, this is the way that women ought to be, even though today's society is going to tell you the exact opposite, which is why we're even covering it at all tonight. But let's keep going on here because um, that's an important point. It's a very important point when it comes to behaving ourselves in the house of God. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Because church is not a free-for-all. It's not a circus. It's not a free-for-all either. It's not just, just anything goes here. God has established an authority structure within the church. Jesus Christ is the head. No doubt about it. If Jesus Christ is not your head, then you're not even a legitimate church. Jesus Christ needs to be the head and, and, and the one that's ultimately governing the church and that you are looking to as having the authority over your church. But next under Jesus Christ himself is the bishop or the pastor. This is the way that God has outlined it. Next under him then would be the deacon and then the congregation. Now many things are spelled out for us in the Bible, but not everything is, right? So, you know, when you come into our church, we're going to sing a song. We're going to pray a prayer. We're going to sing another song. We're going to go through various activities and events and things that are coming up and, you know, and other things going on in the church, updating you on people's health within the church, going through the you know, various prayers, all the various things that we do. And we're going to sing another song. Then we're going to go into the Bible. We're going to preach. We're going to teach the Word of God. Then we're going to sing another song, and then we're going to be dismissed. We're going to fellowship. Okay? That outline, that's what we do here. You're not going to find that, you know, laid out. This is the order of service in the New Testament church. It's not there. So we need to be able to use biblical teaching and biblical concepts to get an understanding of, of how do we do things here, right? There's always going to be an order. We always want everything to be done decently in order, but God does give us some level of freedom to kind of do what, what we think is right and, and do things. You know, he says, as long as it's being done decently in order and you're not contradicting anything in our scripture, you know what, go ahead and do it. Sing as many songs as you want. You don't have to sing four. You can sing two. You can sing ten. You, can, you know, whatever. And that's part of the, the pastoral, you know, headship there of being able to determine these things. 1 Timothy 3, look at verse 15, and then we're going to jump back up. Verse 15 says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So everything up to that point, and we're going to go back up to verse number 1 and read through this chapter, but verse 15 kind of summarizes that, saying that all these things are done, he said, by Terry Long, he's giving him this instruction. He's giving Timothy, the Apostle Paul is giving Timothy this instruction. So he's like, hey, you need to know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. 
because I might not be there for a while. You need to make sure things are being run the way they ought to be run because church is important because it's the church of the living God. God is alive. God wants us doing work. This is actively involved. We're not just going to some dead church like the Catholic church that just does a bunch of rituals and then goes home. Eats a wafer, think they're, they're eating human flesh and then, you know, got their, got their little bit of God and they're going home. We serve a living God. We serve a God that's, that's actively doing things and wants us to be out there actively doing things too. And this is the pillar and ground of the truth in the church. So it's very important. 1 Timothy 3, let's jump up to verse number 1. The Bible says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. There is an office. It is established by God. It is, there is a position within the church of a bishop. Verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. These are qualifications. We're going to get through some more. Qualifications given on the person who is supposed to be bishoping, shepherding, pastoring the flock, the local congregation. God says this is what needs to be in that pastor that's holding that office. And if he doesn't have these attributes, if he doesn't have these qualities, then he shouldn't be bishoping. He shouldn't be pastoring. If God's house is being run decently and in order, then this is the way it's going to be. You are going to have a pastor that meets these conditions. Verse number three, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now, this is an important statement there that's in parentheses. Because as we're going through the various qualifications, hey, you need to be able to teach. You need to be a husband of one wife. You need to not just be getting into fistfights, getting into brawls. You need to be someone that's not given to wine. You're not some drunkard. You're not, you're not going out and, and um, you're not greedy. You're not covetous, right? Because all those things are going are gonna to take you away from doing the job you're supposed to be doing. Because you're supposed to be watching over people here. The pastor is supposed to be a man that knows how to rule his own house. That's why, you know, if his children are in gravity, if they're in subjection, if they listen to him, if dad says, no, don't do that, and they listen and don't do that, if dad says, sit down and be quiet, they sit down and be quiet, that's having your children in subjection to you. That's evidence that, hey, you at least know how to lead your family. If you know how to rule your own house, those are the skills that a, that a person needs to have then in order to pastor a church. Why? Because you're ruling, in a sense, over a church. You're leading a group of people. You're watching over them and taking care of them. And you need to have these skills in order for things to be run decently and in order. And he uses that, and that's what, he uses the phrase, rule his own house, to t and taking care of the church of God because the pastor is ruling over this church, even though Christ is the ultimate authority, the pastor is supposed to be in line with that authority as he rules over the church. But see, people today, again, it's one of those things, the guy we're talking to today, I don't go to church because I don't need some man to tell me what the Bible says. Right? Yeah, you know what? You don't need a man to tell you what the Bible says. You don't. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible, that God has given certain gifts unto men. And to some, he's given pastors and deacons. And to some, he's given, you know, prophets and evangelists. And, and when he's given people a gift to pastor, and he's telling us not to forsake the assembling of, the, of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but we need to be coming together so much the more as you see the day approaching. And then you see him giving all of these rules. It's like, so you're going to stay at home. Who's the bishop in your home? Oh, are you? Do you, I, I, do you meet all these qualifications? I, you know, is, this, is this the office that you've attained to? How did you get into that office? Who ordained you? These days, people want to mock and scoff at church and even the importance of church. It's time that we get a, a, a healthy respect of church, respect for the pastor, respect for the institution, for the, for the pillar and ground of the truth. And when we have that respect, we're going to want to do everything decently and in order. And actually pay attention to things. Let's care about this. Let's care about the way the church looks. Let's care about the people that come into this church. Let's greet everybody. Let's be welcoming. You know, this is a church. It's a group of people. 
But let's also listen when the pastor says something that's not against God, that's not out of line of the will of Jesus Christ, and he says, this is the way we're going to do things here, then listen to the way the pastor says to do them, and do them that way. And especially these days, too, and this isn't even in my notes, but I, I, like many other people, I love to listen to other preaching. I love listening to other sermons. I love listening to Pastor Romero, Pastor Jimenez, Pastor. I, I love listening to as much good preaching as I can. It's great. But you know what? We're independent churches. We're independent from each other. There's nothing wrong with hearing other great preachers, other men of God. There's, I mean, Brother Garrett's a great preacher. We had him preach for us this morning. He goes to another church. Now, there's some things that we're going to disagree on, and that's fine. That's fine. I mean, we're, we're brothers in Christ. But what we need to understand, and, what you, and if you're visiting from another church, you need to understand this too. The, the, the pastor, the church that you are a member of, the church that you belong to, you are under that authority of that pastor. So if there's something, you know, do you have to agree with everything that he says? No. No, you see something different in the Bible, you could believe something totally different than that. But you know what you ought to do? Is stay in line with, with the way that he's operating and running that church. And I don't care if our church or some other church does things different. Don't think that you have this, this now that some, some kind of authority saying, well, you know what? They do it this way, and I'm just going to do it that way and just d completely go against what your church and what your pastor is teaching. That's, that's not right. And we need to be aware of this. We need to, to know, and you know, Brother, the, the Segles family is a great example of this. They were going to another church for a while. That's not really of the same vein at all, a variety of, of Baptist churches, which is why they moved out here. But you know what they did? They submitted themselves under the authority of that pastor in that church. And they had their own beliefs and did what they thought was right and didn't, didn't have to, you know, and I'm sure the church wasn't doing anything just outlandish, just way, just outside of, you know, the, the spectrum of authority of the pastor or anything like that, because I never heard that from him. He's shaking his head now. It didn't happen. You know, obviously in some bizarre situations, you go to some Pentecostal church or something, then, yeah, it is, I mean, just get out of there. <laughs> but you go to any semblance where you actually have believers there congregating and, and the pastor's a normal pastor, not just completely going off the wall with, uh, with, with their, what they're doing there, then just go along with it. I mean, follow that leadership of the pastor. Especially if they're meeting all these qualifications of a pastor. I mean, there's... You know, this, this is a, I don't want to say it's extremely difficult, but there's a lot of people that don't meet these qualifications. And there's a lot of people that think they know a lot about the Bible and haven't really read very much of the Bible. And we need to all be able to, to hum ourselves a little bit to, uh, to, to receive and start. And even if you have, you know, had a lot of Bible reading, look, I'm not above instruction. I know, that's one of the reasons why I love listening to preaching. If I thought I knew it all, then I wouldn't even waste my time. I love listening to other people preach. We should all be open to, to receiving instruction, but specifically when you're in a house of God and you're following, you know, there's a pastor in charge there, go with what he's saying. I mean, I'm not saying just blindly accept every word that comes out of his mouth. Don't get me wrong. Gauge everything against Scripture. But if there's something that the church does, maybe you don't agree with it, you know what? You, do, you don't have to necessarily always follow along with it, but don't go against what that church is teaching. Don't, don't be rebellious against that church because all you're going to do is create division within the church. Let's keep going here through these uh, qualifications. Verse number six, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And this is an important point too, you know, for just for a pastor, but all of these qualifications, it's not like, well, that's just for the pastor, it's not for me. Okay, any standard that you have can be applicable to any Christian, right? All he's saying is that if you don't have these things, then you can't pastor. Every believer should have these skills. I mean, except for the women when it comes to ruling over their household, all right? You still should be able to rule your children, but you don't, you know... Everything else, not giving to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy, all these various things, we all should have those. Not just everybody should have that. And I like what it says in verse 7, more we must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You know, you hear a lot of hard preaching. And, and oftentimes you hear a lot of attitude with that preaching, right? And, and 
we want to be careful not to get caught up in almost an arrogant, self-righteous type of an attitude when you hear the hard preaching to where you're just coming across at everybody else as being, you know, this, this holier than thou and keeping with yourself a, uh, you know, a good report of them which are without. We're not out just starting to go, especially when we go out sowing, we're not go out trying to start fights with people. We're not out just trying to argue with people and, and tell everyone why they're wrong and why we're right because, you know, I go to this church and no, every, all these other pastors are afraid to say anything and you need to, you, you need to get this right. You know, that's, that's, not, that's not the way things are, are, are to be done. And definitely not in this church. We're not, we're not telling anyone to go out and start fights with people. We do things decently and in order within the church and when we're sent out to preach, we are trying to do our best to win over people to Christ. Let's keep going here. Verse number eight. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. So he's explaining to Timothy, look, you need to have a bishop and this is the qualifications. And if there's enough people, you know, and you have a deacon, these are qualifications for a deacon. You know, for this church to be operating and running decently and in order, make sure you're getting people like this. Because one of the charges that Paul gave to Timothy was to ordain elders in various churches that had already been established from the result of all of their soul winning. They're giving a the gospel to tons of people. And Paul's traveling around. He's trying to help churches get in start. He's like, get a church established over here. Okay, we're going to get a church established. You know, we, we got a lot more people to get saved. Apostle Paul wasn't, wasn't pastoring any church. He was going out and getting people saved. And as a result, you got a whole bunch of people saved, Right? They want to serve God. And this is, this is something similar to what's been happening in Africa. You've got these soul winning events going on. You've got a lot of people getting saved, but they don't really have anywhere to go. So what's going to happen? Well, hopefully they'll start to kind of congregate together and form some form of a church because they're like-minded believers. They want, they want to assemble together. That makes sense. When you're saved, you want to assemble with other people that are believers. And, what he's, and this is what was happening there. There was a lot of good reception. They were getting tons of people saved and lots of churches started. So this was a big task. And he's saying, okay, Timothy, okay, Titus, let's go out. And, and now here's what you need to look for. Here are the type of people that need to be ordained to be running these churches. And get them established and get them set up. People look at the events and the, and, and the situations that were going on then and they want to try to apply it now to them. These days they say, well, you know, I don't see people getting sent out to start churches. And, they, you know, they mock all that and say, well, who ordains you? It's like, look, the way things happened in the Bible happened out of necessity. You got tons of people getting saved. And, not, you know, why would we want a church to just, you know, it's not ideal for church just to be meeting up and not having any direction, not having any leadership. Obviously, you want it first and foremost, you want people to get saved and come out of hell, right? Save their souls. That's priority number one, but it's not ideal to just leave them off to themselves either. They ought to be guided. They ought to be taught. They ought to be trained, which is why you start finding the qualifications and saying, ordain men that fit this bill. And then they could actually be a, a well-functioning church to do that much more for the Lord. Let's um, turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 11. I'm going to shift gears a little bit here and kind of go into just some smaller issues. Some of these things, they're not even going to be found in Scripture, but I want to cover them in how to behave yourself in the house of God because this is how we are doing it here. And I wanted to show you the authority of the, of the pastor to be able to, to, to lay out some rules in church. Now, I'm not one that really likes rules, if you know me at all. You know, I'm not some big rule guy. I'm never going to make you sign some piece of paper that says, I promise that I'm going to live this type of life and stuff. We don't do that here. Other churches do that. We're not going to do that. However, I'm going to lay out for you some of the things that I think that ought to be done and, and kind of looked at as far as it goes to respecting the house of God. Because we ought to have respect for the house of God. 
And the way that I look at this is, think about if you were to attend a wedding ceremony. A wedding ceremony is something that you would go to and attend where you are going to have respect for the people that are getting married, right? Think about that. Think about an environment of a wedding that you've been to. Think about the things that go on there. Usually, it's pretty quiet, right? People aren't just gabbing and talking and, and getting on their phones. And I mean, these days, maybe people do that. I don't know. But I'll tell you what, it's a really rude thing to do when you've got something going on up here and you've got two people that you're there to support and they're making a big decision and you're there to help you know, support them in their wedding and you're just playing Tetris or something on your, on your phone. Probably not Tetris, I don't know what it is these days, but um, you're playing Bejeweled or something on your, on your, on your phone. Right? I'm still probably outdated, I'm sorry. but <laughs> That's just one example. But what about like eating and drinking? I mean, you're just going to be bringing in your breakfast and just opening up your wrapper and eating your you know, Egg McMuffin or whatever during a wedding ceremony. I don't think you'd be doing that, right? And look, this is just a wedding ceremony. We're going to compare that to the house of God. You think we ought to just be sitting in your chairs? You know, I'm, uh, it's getting kind of hungry. You know, I normally eat lunch at 11, but you got church all the way up until noon. You know, I'm just going to eat right here. I'm just going to kick my feet up, eat some popcorn, and listen to some preaching. That is disrespectful. And that is not the way that we run things here. Now, I don't have a hard and fast rule. If, it, if somebody brings in some food, I'm not going to go up to them, take it out of their hands, and put it over there, okay? It's not, it's, not the way we op, it's not the way I operate things here. But I'm teaching this to you tonight so that we could all just have a little bit of respect. And I'm not saying anyone's even doing this right now. This is preventative maintenance, okay? So if I do say something that, that people are guilty of or you do, you've done before, I, 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 none of this stuff I even have anyone in mind for, okay? Just, I'm just laying it out there. So take it as you will. These are things that... that I think is disrespectful. Eating and drinking just, just in the middle of service, I think that's disrespectful. Chewing gum. I know even when I was in, in school, never allowed to chew gum in the classroom. Never allowed, I mean, my parents, we go into church, we go into something like that, it's disrespectful. I don't, and I, honestly, I don't even know why. <laughs> okay. I don't know exactly why it is, but this is something that I think that, that just, at, at least with this one example of chewing gum, it's a cultural thing, but I do think it's a sign of disrespect. And I think that we ought to at least, you know, as much as possible, let's say, you know what? Maybe it's a silly thing. Maybe it's not that big of a deal. But I really respect God and I respect this church. And I just want to make sure that, that we could be looked at and seen as having total respect for what's going on in this place. We'll move on to, uh, to distractions, right? Because also... Showing respect in the house of God, we want to respect those around us. Speaking of distractions, right, we got, we got a great distraction going on right now. Now, when it comes to little children, very little ones, we're in, we're in a small room right now. We don't have a mother baby room. We don't have an area for them to take them out. So when it's possible, usually we, you know, we'll step outside or something like that. But we also have the mentality within this church that we're going to suffer the little children to come unto me. There are certain things that we put up with around us, but at the same time, you know, parents should be mindful of other people as well. So when things get way out of control, it's time to move them out. Um, on that line, thinking about getting up and just going to the bathroom, you know, I'm not saying you're not allowed to use the bathroom. Okay, so don't, don't take this the wrong way. But hopefully as adults, unless you have a problem, we should be able to sit through an hour, an hour and a half without having to get up and use the bathroom. Every time someone gets up, it's a distraction. You're going back and forth. And, you know, and even for just a minute, it's a natural thing. You listen to preaching, all of a sudden someone gets up, you go, oh, look what they're doing. And then boom, your mind just loses some of that focus. Um, again, getting up and getting drinks and you know, cell phones and everything else, you know, someone's phone rings, whatever. Let's try to, to have enough respect for the house of God to, to bring the distractions to a minimum and just try to, to keep all of that stuff under control during this time. I mean, you're taking an hour, hour and a half out of your life. Let's try to just focus on what's being, what's at hand here. Uh, I had you turn to Mark chapter 11, yes? yes. Mark 11. We're going to start reading in verse 15 because... Church is also not a place for buying or selling. We're going to see there, Mark 11, verse 15, and they come to Jerusalem. 
And Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. Jesus felt very strongly about this point. He felt so strongly that he made a whip and drove people out of, of the temple, flipped over tables, and made a really big scene about it. Right. He feels very strongly about this, and you should too. Amen. Church is not a place, first and foremost, to be buying and selling anything, which is why we don't sell anything in this church. We offer stuff for free. All the materials, everything in this church is available for free. We're not going to charge you for any of it. Because we're not going to make God's house a house of merchandise. However, along with that, it's not a place for you to be trying to sell your stuff to other people within the church. This is not a place to be finding new contacts and saying, how can I sell these things? And these days, there's a lot of things to sell. There's a lot of ways to make business, a lot of ways to earn money. Have at it. Go do it. Go out in the world. Do whatever you do to make a living, to make, you know, to make ends meet. But don't come to church and try to recruit people to buy your stuff. You're treating people then like merchandise. You're, you're, you're going into God's house where people are coming to worship God. And now what you're going to do is you're going to end up making people feel uncomfortable. You know, and, and this, is, this happens all the time. And, and for anyone that, that does anything like this, I've already told my wife, you're not allowed to go to any of these parties or any of these things. And look, I don't care if you do this stuff. It doesn't matter to me at all. This is just fine. Do what you want to do. And I, I actually don't have a problem with it all. But when um, I've told her, especially because of with church and stuff, don't do any of that stuff. Don't go and buy this stuff because what happens is, ultimately, it doesn't happen with everybody. Okay, there's some people that, that are just fine with this. But you get someone who, they start a business and they want, you know, and it's selling candles or it's selling whatever. Right? And the way that they do it is they have these big parties and they get everyone to come over. And, you know, usually when you have friends, you want to help them out, you want to promote them, you want to support them, and you do all this other stuff. But oftentimes it's kind of like a guilt thing. Right? You're trying, you're like, man, I don't really want to buy this, but I, but I feel this. But, and then if you say no, then you end up offending the person that's, that's, saying, you know, that's inviting you to this. Say, well, I thought you were my friend. And, and look, this didn't happen with anyone in here, but my wife recently said no to someone and it was like the person took offense. And, and, I've, and this is why I've told her before. I said, you know what? Just tell them this is what your husband said. Because I don't want there to be any problems between people. Right? I don't want there to be any situations where, where some business is getting in the way of, of having a good fellowship with someone that's someone from church or some, you know, people that, that are brothers and sisters in Christ. And like I said, I don't have a problem with those. I mean, do those businesses? That's fine with me. I don't have a problem with that. My point is not to be bringing it into the church and just targeting people that are in church to come in and make money off of them, okay? There's a big difference. There's a lot of people out there to target and make money from. Go do that, but don't be using the people from church to do that. And we saw from, Jesus, you know, we're not, we're not buying, we're not selling. None of that stuff takes place in here. We're not gonna open up our church to be used as a business, to be selling things and buying things. None of it. We're gonna stay away from it as much as possible. Turn if you would to Psalm chapter 15. <sighs> Psalm 15 is going to give us a good idea of just a little bit of godly behavior from the Bible. How we behave ourselves in the house of God. Real basic rules. Psalm 15, look at verse number one. Bible reads, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? We're talking about abiding with God, abiding in God's tabernacle. You want to stick around in church? You want to get planted in church? Abiding in God's house? Well, let's, let's look and see how he answers this. Who, who is going to abide in that tabernacle? Tabernacle, verse two. He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. 
Look at verse number three. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. One of the things I also will not tolerate in this church is a backbiting tongue. I find out people are talking about other members of this church. That's not allowed. You're going to get your face ripped off in a sermon, and that's going to be the nice way of dealing with it before getting approached. I, I want, you know, and, and look, thank God, to my knowledge, we've never had this problem in church. People here are great. People are great. We're, we should be praying for other people, not talking bad about them behind their back. Right. The only time I want to hear anything about anyone, as far as sin goes or something like that, is if it's so serious that it's something that's like, hey, this person we need to break fellowship with. Because they're a drunkard, or they're a railer, or they're an extortioner, right? These things that the Bible lays out as being like, this is serious, okay? You, you hear about something like that? That's not backbiting. Go ahead and let me know about that. But that's usually not the problems that people have. Right. Usually it's some personality conflict. Right. Usually someone said they were going to do something, or looked at you the wrong way, or didn't like something on Facebook, or whatever, right. okay? We're not going to deal with the backbiting here. And if you're going to last long in this church, just, just keep that in mind. And you start to hear people that start doing that, you stop the problem right there. You don't even need to come to me. You stop the problem. You give them an angry countenance, as the book of Proverbs says, and, and you make sure that they know that, that, that you're the wrong person. Don't be spreading rumors to me because I don't want to hear it. You have, the, you have the most power individually to stop that type of nonsense from happening before it spreads even more. And let them know, hey, you know, and if you think they're doing it, just, just kind of ignorantly, you, know, you say, you know what you're doing right now is backbiting. Let them know. I mean, if you love that person, let them know. Because it's going to be way worse. For, I mean, you don't want to see your brother or sister in Christ just, just continuing in sin. Because that's going to do a lot of damage to the church and to themselves. Let them know right up front. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, which means hated, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord, which is why we preach so hard against the sodomites and against other just perversions and sin. These are vile people and they're hated. You know, this is why we preach on that stuff, because I'm trying to teach that we're supposed to be hating the vile person. If you're going to last long in this church, you better get used to that type of preaching that we're contemning the vile person. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. Those are our heroes. Those are the people we look up to. Those are the people that, that are going to get honor is those that fear God and keep his commandments. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. Verse 5, he that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. There should be no gossip in the church. Everyone should be walking uprightly, speaking the truth in his heart and loving the church and not looking down your nose at other people. Amen. So in closing, just remember that we all make up this church. Okay, even though I, you know, I'm the pastor and, and kind of have the rule and make up some of the rules that are going on and the way that we're going to do things in order, I am not the church by any means. I am one member of this church. I have one office to fill. We all make up this church and, and just think about this, you know, when it goes to just behaving yourself in the house of God, how much do you love the church, how much do you love, you know, coming here and learning and, and praising God, and, and how much you have respect for this place. You consider that for yourself. And think about how well do you take care of yourself at home. I think that um, that should be the minimum standard of how you treat things here, right? Just because... It doesn't belong, you know, everything's free here. It doesn't mean that we just treat it poorly, right? right. You think about the furniture, things like that. How would you treat your furniture at home? Well, you're just going to come here and just, oh, whatever. You know, you just, like when you go home and you spill something, you just like leave it for days and just not care. Eh, well, whatever. You know, you think about that when you're here, okay? You say, yeah, but it's not mine. Well, it is. It's all of ours. This church, everything here belongs to all of us. And, and, um, you know, if you're a member here and you see something needs to be done, you know, something needs to be cleaned, something needs to be vacuumed, garbage needs to be taken out, please just do it. You know, at the end of the day, I'm responsible for all of this stuff. 
So if you're wondering how some things get done just every day, you know, the churches are, all, the, the, the rows are always put in order. The songbooks are always evenly spaced out. There's, there's always things, supplies in the bathroom. Um, hopefully everything is always clean. Hope, you know, all of this stuff, ultimately, you know, I'm not the only one that does this. And, and I thank everybody that, that has helped out and, and, and helps with everything in this church. Okay, but at the end of the day, it falls on me. So I, it's going to get done no matter what. But I just want to have the mindset and mentality of everybody here just not to forget that there's other basic things that just need to be done because it's a space, because it's a, a, a space that we occupy. Just as much as you do things at home, the cleaning and you know, the, the various chores that need to be done, they need to be done here too. And um, we're all part of this church. Um, you know, when, as we grow and get a little bit bigger, I'll start, you know, kind of delegating a little bit of responsibility for people who volunteer and want to do this stuff to just make sure there's always someone responsible for doing that. But right now, I don't think we need to have that yet because we're, we're not quite that big yet. So let's try to just everyone pitch in when you see something needs to be done. Just just please help out and do that. And like I said, this whole sermon there's not, there's not anything that I could think of in this sermon that anyone has done wrong. So like, you know, if, if, you've, if you've been convicted tonight, it's not because I've been, been picking on you or thinking about you personally at all, no matter what has been said. Okay, but this is preventive maintenance. This is something I believe is important, how we ought to behave ourselves in the house of God. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much uh, for the clear instruction that we have from your words, dear Lord. Pray that you please help us all to, to honor and respect the Bible and, and exalt that as being our be-all, end-all for all, for all truth and all wisdom, dear God, and that we don't rely on what the, the world thinks or what the culture dictates, dear God, but what your word says. And um, if, if you know, people want to make fun of us for that, so be it. We're going to stay true to your word and that everything that we do in this house, dear God, is, uh, is going to be in compliance with your words. And Lord, if there's anything that we're doing that's not right, Lord, I pray that you would please enlighten us and, and help me to see our errors and, and point them out to us. Make it obvious, dear God, so that we could get them right. Because ultimately what we care about is serving you and doing what's right in your eyes, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.